So I'm, I'm Andy Bennett, I'm the, I'm the CTO at a company called Skipjack and we're a, we're a fairly, fairly newly funded company um, last year and we're looking to use machine learning guided techniques in order to um, work out how to deploy existing workloads into, into cloud services. So I'm going to tell you um, what, 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 it, what it is we're doing and, and how, we'd, how we're doing that and kind of some of the learnings that, we, that we've come across while we've been doing that. Um, I'm going to, it's going to be quite a technical talk. Hopefully, um, you won't feel like I've, I've pitched you at all, and that's not the intention. Um, so, um, the underlying problem that we're, that we're solving is that it turns out that big, big enterprises have, uh, or even even much smaller companies these days, have a lot of apps. They um, they they write an app for something, that, and then it, ne it never goes away. So. Um, People tend to, even, even the, the, the DevOps movement is, is making a lot of traction and still there's kind of this attitude where the developers will build an app and then they'll throw it over the wall to operations and then it'll stay in operations for a very long time. The, um, often the workload will change over time and ops basically end up with a lot of poorly understood apps or apps that they don't understand very well and apps that are kind of doing things that they didn't, weren't intended to do when they, when they were first delivered. And despite all of this, they need to have kind of flexibility to deploy this app in the right environment. And um, they, they've still got to be effective in, in their work, even if, they, even if they haven't got the developers on hand who built the app and who understand the app. So um, you know, they need this flexibility to control the spending, like the cost of, the cost of running the infrastructure. And, um, the vast majority of the stuff they're looking after is, is legacy apps. Um, so um, apps tend to appear and then they disappear at a slower rate than the new apps are appearing. So that it turns out that at any one point in time, whatever technology you're using, the vast majority of what you have is, is older stuff and legacy stuff that you have to keep running for some reason. So they have to, uh, as I said, they have to um, still be effective in their work and it turns out that the best way to do this is to over-provision. Over-provisioning is the norm. It costs a little bit more money, but it allows them to um, it allows them to get it done quickly and, and move on to the next thing. So, ops, ops departments in general, they, they they kind of want to be agile. So, two of the things that we're, we're trying to help them be is more agile and more lean. Um, I'm not really going to cover any rugged stuff this afternoon, but they're um, they're interested in being agile, and what they want to do is get their apps that they've been sent into production quickly without manually tuning them, without a lot of manual work and automating as much as possible. And the other thing that ops want to be is that they want to be lean. So they, in general, the ops departments are still considered as a cost center in the business and um, they're kind of a necessary part of the business, but they they're not often contributing to the core, the core product of the business and the core business value that the, the company's product is offering. So, so they want to reduce their costs and, and keep their costs down as much as possible. Um, so we've been we've been trying to apply some machine learning in this in this area, and our customers tend to have lots of Java workloads in the JVM, a few a few .NET workloads in the Common Language Runtime. They're deploying on Windows and Linux, and they've got a wide variety of app servers and, and containers and servlets and this kind of thing that they that they're using. Um, so I'm going to talk. Um, I'm going I'm to illustrate what we're doing with the example of a, of a small microservice that that you might deploy in. Amazon EC2, for example, and um, what what we'll do is we'll we'll take your microservice and we will um, we will send a, t a test workload to it and characterize it for performance, and then we will work out how much it costs to run on different size um, cloud instances. So here's a here's the kind of output that we might produce, and each one of these bar graphs is is one. Um, one different type of instance type, maybe an Amazon EC2, um, like a, a T2 small or M3 large or a, a Azure um, A1 basic, or maybe even a, a private cloud in, in, in vCenter or something. And the, the darker bars are the, um, uh, what we benchmark your app at on that instance with your, with your test load at, at, the, at the baseline as you, as you provided it. And then the, the blue bars on top of that are the extra performance that we managed to get out of your app after we tuned it 
with, um, with, with, our, with our software. So what, what we do is we're choosing, um, we're doing a black box optimization. So we, we don't know much about your source code or your workload. We don't know, um, we don't change anything inside your, your app, but we, what we're trying to do is offer tuning settings to, for example, the JVM or the OS or, or the platform in some way. And so we vary these in, in different ways based on the feedback from the test. And we also vary them based on what we know about different type, how different types of app respond to different amounts of resources in different areas. So the, um, the blue bar is, is what happens when we apply the best settings that we found on that particular instance type. And so you can see this, this guy here. This guy is a, um, is a T2 micro, sorry, T2, T2 medium running in Amazon. And you're getting approximately a performance rating of 432, which is a, it's kind of an arbitrary measure relative to all, all the others in that, um, in that test. So there's no particular unit for that. Um, but it's kind of transactions per second, whatever your transaction happened to be. And that costs, if you get a reserve instance pricing for Amazon, one, one of those instances will cost you about $326 a year to run. I uh, checked the price this afternoon, so that, that's their current price. And it's approximately, the, so after optimization, it's approximately the same height as this bar, which is actually an AWS M3 medium, which costs, um, costs about 25% more to run. And you only get a 15% uplift in actual performance. So depending on where your performance target actually is, you might be able to move that workload from an M3 medium into a T2 medium and still um, meet all your SLAs and, and requirements. And if you can do that without really any outlay of effort on the part of the ops team, then, then, then you've got to win. Um, the idea with a microservice is that you can deploy lots of these. So you can reap that 25% that saving across all of, the, um, all of the deployments of that particular microservice in, in the cloud. Um, so how, how, what we do is we, we do these tests for all the different types of instance. And in order to get a optimal performance reading for each one of these graph um, bar charts, we're going to do a, a, series of, um, a series of different tests under different conditions on that particular instance. And so this is what a, a search for um, one of those bars looks like. Each one of these red lines is a test that's currently running. and um, it's going to have a performance metric depending on how high the bar is. And we're going to be varying things like maybe the garbage collector um, settings or, or maybe, um, maybe the way the TCP stack is configured in the kernel or something like this. Um, so we, we, do, we deploy the test. We do all, this, all the settings. And then we take the best run with the best settings as the, as the best optimal configuration for that particular platform. Um, now, it turns out that. It's really difficult to do this, this um, auto automatically. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of customers, and they're pretty excited about this. When you go and talk to a developer about this, they get less excited. Um, they, they will tell you that, well, you know, I, I designed my algorithm, and I know exactly how much memory it uses, so I know how to choose the heap sizes in the JVM, and, and I know the access pattern, and, I, and so I understand how it interacts with the garbage collector. And they, they believe that they have a really good understanding of of their workload. And I think it's pro probably true in the case where they, d they designed their workload and send it to ops. But what tends to happen after the, after the workload goes into production is that the workload changes over time. Maybe it grows over time. Maybe the, the visitors are doing slightly different things with it over time. And so as the, as the lifetime of the app continues, the, the way it was used when it was first deployed and the, and the amount of resources when it's first deployed is actually quite a lot different from what it can end up using over time. And it turns out that actually, um, even if they have a quite a good feel for the parameter space, it's actually massive. Um, we, 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 this is just an, a, an example. We, we, can, um, we can tune most of the JVM parameters. There's about 18 or 20 of them. Um, maybe like Tomcat or WebSphere or something has a handful of parameters that you're going um, you, to tune as well. Maybe your underlying operating system has like TCP queue sizes and and swap space and different CPU and I/O schedulers that you can that you can try out as well. And it turns out if you work out how many different configuration permutations there are, then there's um, even with those there's there's just 28 different dimensions there, and there's there's a lot of a lot of scope for for exploring this space. Um, and even if um, th this is the example of the um, characterizing the performance on just one of the 
types of instance at, at, at um, Amazon, for example. Here we're doing about 100 tests, and even that isn't going to possibly cover it all or anywhere near to that. My marketing guy tells me we can, we can explore a quintillion, quintillion different possibilities, and so it's just not reasonable to, to try them all out, and it's not, it's not, it's not um, cost effective in time or money to do that. To do that. So how do we do that then? So if you, I'm going to do an example here with just a pair of parameters. If you have um, a parameter, two parameters with two values each, or, well, you have, to, you have two parameters with a range of values each, and you want to sample just two different values of each of them. And so that, that involves four tests. And if you want to do two more tests, uh, if you want to um, sample two more parameters for parameter, uh, two more values for parameter one, you end up with four more tests that you have to do. And each, each time you add a, add a dimension, you're, you're kind of having this explosion of, of combinations. And so um, th there's, there's two things we do. One is we can kind of take quite a coarse, um, coarse gr granularity over the entire search space. And another one is we can kind of limit that further by kind of cleverly choosing the intersection points between the different dimensions so that we can um, work out one dimension against another as an independent variable, and then work out the correlation between all of the different um, parameters that you can set. So this, is, this here is what's called a, a Latin hypercube, and it's a little bit like the eight queens problem. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the eight queens problem, but the idea is that on a, on a chessboard, you have to put, you have eight, eight rows and eight columns, and you have to place on there eight queens such that none of them are attacking any of the other ones. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of different solutions for this. And, um, what, it, what it means is basically you end up with at least one queen in every row and every column. So you get an, an intersection between those two parameters at that point. And that's the, um, w without any other training data, that's the, uh, that's the bare minimum number of parameters that you can use in order to kind of get a rough idea of the extent of the performance over that entire, um, entire space. Um, so we do a bunch of tests about, we, we, try and, we try and limit it to 100 or, or 200 per, per instance type, and we plot them for performance. So we work out what, what, what they, um, how well they did on, your, on, your, on the customer's metric of what they're trying to do with, um, with their workload. And then we fit, a, um, we fit a curve to that to try and work out how it changes over, over the area that you, can, that you can perform the tests in. And um, from that, we can kind of predict other points and maybe run a couple of other tests to kind of verify or falsify hypotheses we have about how the performance changes in certain areas. And um, on top of that, we then can apply some hill climbing algorithms to try and maximize the performance that you get for, for that particular instance. Um, but it turns out there's, there's, no, there's no silver bullet here. The, um, the, the, the hope was that maybe, you know, if you set the heap size to maximum, maybe everything will go faster always. Um, and it turns out this isn't the case. We, we did some, one of, our, one of our statistics guys did some regressions, and we found that for most, most workloads in most situations, you can come up with five or six parameters, each of which contribute a little bit, though maybe 10 or 15% to the, to the uplift that you can give on a particular, um, on a particular workload. And so... The, the, the bad news is that it's not really possible to, to do this manually. It's something that you have to automate. And the good news is that you can, um, you can actually automate it. So um, it also turns out that setting things to the big numbers doesn't always get you the best results. Like um, there's, a, there's a number of counterintuitive results which turn up. I mean, perhaps they're... Perhaps they're kind of a bit more obvious to people who have done a, done a lot in this area, but often you have to know quite a bit about the, the app specifically to work out the implications of certain, um, certain parameters. So not, um, it's often the case that if you increase the um, number of threads available, you'd think that it would be able to do more stuff at once. And it, it turns out that often if you, if you decrease the number of threads under high load, it brings in the amount of time that it takes for each, each resource. And so the system ends up less busy and it can actually get more work done because it's doing, it's doing less concurrently. So it's not sharing as much stuff. And um, there's also quite a lot of easy wins to be had with, with a lot of applications because most of them has never actually been optimized at all. Um, 
often they're, they're written for de by, de by a developer and then they're, they're deployed for a very specific use case and o over time it grows into something else. It becomes, a, it becomes an important app in your business and people start making demands of it that, that they never did before. So it, it, becomes a, uh, it becomes used in a case where it's never, that it's never been optimized for. And so you can end up with a lot, lot of apps that you've never, never optimized. And so there's often quite a large gain you can make by, by doing anything at all, let, let alone guaranteeing that you have the optimal result. And it's also the case that um, that the that the, um, the the scalability of an app is is limited, and so there's a there's a theoretical maximum that a, a particular app can scale up to on a on a on a machine. And if you give it a bigger machine than that, then it, it won't get any faster because of inherent limits in in the architecture of the app and the way it was written. And there's often um, there's often theories about where, there is, where this limit is, but it's kind of often unknown until you reach that limit. And so if, you, if you're able to do some automated testing, you can discover where that limit is before you reach it, and it helps you to do capacity planning and, and, and cost management and, and prioritize the right kind of development, and, um, and, far, and so you don't end up in a situation where you're, where you're firefighting. So that's the uh, kind of a quick overview of the of the machine learning side and how we how we apply it and the kind of um, benefits that we can get from doing it. Um, obviously, some of you are sat there thinking, "Well, he's he's running like 200 tests. That's 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 not a small uh, that's not a small number to to run in a conventional way." And and this is where we can really take advantage of some of the things that the the kind of the cl more cloudy offerings have to offer. So, kind of the, the um, software defined infrastructure where you can spin up and down serv servers with with APIs and this kind of thing. Um, and I'll, I'll also go into a bit more detail about how we, how we actually run the test itself. So th this is a graph of, um, of one particular test. The, the um, horizontal axis is, is time. We tests run for uh, just over an hour. And, and the vertical axis is the, on the vertical axis on the left is the transactions per second in performance. And the vertical axis on the right is in bytes. Um, so this, this red curve is the important one. The, the red curve is the number of transactions per second that our app was doing, or our microservice was doing at a particular point in time. And it's got, it's got three main features. One is the little ramp at the start, and then we're onto, onto the plateau, and then the four main features. Then the ramp at the end, and then it go, the decline at the end is the fourth feature. So this is a, um, this is, this is a Java workload. And what, what happens at the start is that the, um, the, the, the green line is the um, load that we're presenting to it from the, the, um, from the thing that's generating the test load. And the red thing is the um, number of transactions per second the application under, under test is doing. And what you can see is that it takes some time to kind of warm up. And this is a, a well-known characteristic of, of um, JIT compiled workloads in that what the Java compiler does is it, it um, as, the, as it works out what the hot paths through the application are, it, it, it m compiles them into native machine code for that particular platform, and it, it makes them go faster. And so this can really, um, this can really hurt your um, measure of performance if you measure it at the wrong time, because if, if you just leave the load stable for a bit, you can find that your app suddenly gets faster without having done anything. So the, the, J the JVM itself is quite good at, good at self-tuning. And this, this blue curve, is showing you the size of the, um, the the size of the region that the JVM is storing the compiled code in, and you can see that when the region fills up, it's about set to about 100 megabytes here. Um, when it fills up, the performance levels out, and and that is the um, that's the optimal um, that, that's the optimal um, processing rate for that that particular load that was given in green. And so our, our, when we're sure that that phase is complete, we can get, move on to the next phase, which is to gradually ramp the load up until we can find where the peak is. So as I, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, if you, if you overload the system, actually the, re, the, um, the response will go down again because things end up um, stuck in queues and waiting for things. And so the, um, the contention increases and then the, um, the um, the response of any, uh, the latency of any particular response goes down. So, as we increase the load, we find a we find a peak point here, which is which is the um, which is the optimal um, point for this particular machine with those particular settings. That's as fast as it goes. And if you continue to increase the load, still, it, then it starts to tail off again. And what you find is there's a bit of a there's a bit of a cliff there. Um, 
where basically is when you when you get to the machine to saturation point it's, it performs really poorly and also it has quite a lot of jitter you see when it was in the stable point before it was nice and flat and um, got um, the the variance in the blobs was quite small that's quite a nice place for the machine to be running whereas if you're running it up here then you're not really that sure what's going to be happening to your workload it could be some things could start to take a really long time and what what you'll find is that these averages I'm plotting here but what you'll find is that Probably, if, if we, um, this is because this is a, a normal mean average, 50% of your, your users are getting worse, um, a worse, worse experience than that. So if you keep that variance nice and small, you can make better guarantees about the fact that you're delivering a good service to everyone. So the, the idea is to pick, pick the optimal point and not, not give too much load. Um, this graph here goes into a bit more detail about that. The, green, the, the red, again, is the the performance, the transactions per second that the, that the service is doing, and the green is the, the latency, um, the average latency for that request, so the, the length of time it takes for a particular request to happen. So the, the red is the number, of, the number of requests that are finishing per second, and the green is the, number of, the, the, length of time, the average length of time that each request takes. Um, so it assumes that there's more than one in flight at a time. So that if you um, take the point where you're getting the most throughput, you can find that the latency is um, not the smallest. So you can, you can actually trade this off. You can say, actually, I want, to, I want my service to be more snappy for my, um, for my user. And so you can pick an arbitrary point that you, that you want for your, your service level agreement on the latency curve. And you can, move the, um, you can move the bar back so that you say, the optimal performance is not just how much throughput I'm getting, but it's, it's a certain amount of throughput with a guarantee that most of the requests are completing in 50 milliseconds or something. And so you can move it, move it back to there. If you pick a point roughly there, you can move the, the line back to there, and then your, um, your maximum performance for that particular configuration becomes that. And so you, you're trading off a little bit of um, throughput for much better response time for each of those and kind of much better quality of service for each of those users. Um, any questions so far? You've been very quiet. Am I going too fast or too slow? Okay. So that's just the, uh, that's kind of the life cycle of a single test. What, when, when we're actually doing a test, you have to get a machine from somewhere. And it turns out that if you get one from, for example, Amazon, you can, you can buy an instance on demand, and then they will bill you at a one hour, um, they'll bill you in one hour increments for that. So um, you've got to spend some time starting your machine up, and that costs you money. And you've got to spend some time installing the thing you want to test on there. And then you need to actually do a test. And the rest of that time until the billing tick happens at the end of the hour is wasted. So if you, if you only spend 20 minutes doing the test, you're paying for 40 minutes that you didn't use. If you spend 61 minutes doing a test, you go into the next billing period and you, you waste 59 minutes. Um, and there's, there's, there's various ways of, of solving this. You can, maybe you can reuse the machine for another test. Um, because basically the green bits are where you're doing the testing and that's, that's the actual value for the application and all, all the rest of the time that that machine is doing things is, is just overhead and cost for, for the testing. And like I said, we're doing approximately 100 or 200 tests on a particular machine with different configurations at each time. And you can trade off the length of time it takes to do that entire search against the cost of that search. Because if you, you, can, you can spin up 100 of those machines individually, and you can do one test on each, and you get your result in an hour, because that's approximately how long we test for. And you waste 33 50% of, um, of your money on, on compute power that you never used. Or you can, um, you can basically double the length of time it takes and, and do two tests per machine, one after the other. And then you, can, you wait two hours, but it costs you about half as much. I mean, th th there's quite a lot of quantization here because the billing period on Amazon is an hour. You, you, it ends up being quite a cliff when you go over into the next hour. You, you have this kind of big extra overhead. On other clouds, such as, um, such as the Microsoft Azure, they have much finer granularity of billing. So they charge you for the first hour, and then after that, they charge you only for the minutes that you use in, the, in that period. So um, part of what we've built is, is some, some schedulers to, um, to, to, to deal with this kind of thing. If, if you go and read the, um, the literature, quite a lot of people like Google and Facebook and people are talking about how to schedule 
where um, how to schedule workloads on kind of what they're calling warehouse scale computers, where they where they own all the computers, they can place the workload where they want, and they they have control over everything. The kind of scheduler we've had to build is 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 about placing different workloads on a variety of different clouds in pu both public clouds and things like like vCenter that customers own, where other other users are on the hosts. So we we, we might have noisy neighbors, and also um, we we get um, we we get build um, per well in this um, example I've just given. So so it's a, it's kind of a sl slightly different type of scheduler, and. Um, the example I've just given is just for one, assumes just one host and one test, but actually what happens is often you, you'll spin up a, a host for the microservice and you'll spin up a host to deliver the test load and you might spin up a host for the database server or the message queue or something like this. And so you end up with quite a complicated scheduling um, scenario where you might have a host ready that can be the database, but you don't have the host that can be the, um, the, the message queue and you have to kind of try and pack the work in as efficiently as you can and try and optimize for the conflicting things, which are length of time it takes to do the test and price of the test. Um, but it works pretty well for microservices because you can, um, you can typically get quite a good um, saving overall, and the cost of the test is generally significantly less than um, the cost of one instance. And with a microservice, te you tend to be scaling out a number of those over a longer period of time. So the cost of test ends up being, being quite efficient and quite small. Um, so that's the material I have, and I'll be interested to take some questions, and I'd like it if you could go on the app and let me know what you thought of the talk. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to look on here for some questions. In the meantime, does anyone have a question they would like to inject? Do you always use... Um do you always just use sort of random parameters, or do you ever use things like profiling or garbage collection log analysis, that sort of thing, to help inform your sort of initial set of parameters? So um, at, at, the, at the moment, we, we can do two things. One is, is like I said, a, a, course, um, a course examination of the entire surface. So if you've got a continuous property like heap size, we might, we might try it from zero to four gigabytes in 100 megabyte chunks or something. Um, the other thing, uh, and, that, and that's quite, a, quite naive, the, the other thing we do is try and fit these in using the Latin hypercube to pick points that work well with the other dimensions. And that, that's not particularly amenable to forcing a lot of choice on a particular parameter. Um, you can typically choose one or two, and then the others kind of tend to fall in in, in particular places or require an inordinately large amount of compute time to work out where to put them. Um, Another thing that we, we're trying to do as we collect data is actually mine the data for different apps, and so classify the apps into, you know, th this looks like an I/O kind of workload, this looks like a, a CPU kind of workload, this is a database, this is a message passing system, and if we can classify the apps like that, then it's we, we can apply the learnings from optimizing those apps and kind of amortize the cost of exploring the parameter space across a kind of a whole suite of apps. So. Um the number of tests that are required to execute uh, to you know to get to uh, a certain level of optimization uh, is it is it totally dependent on the number of parameters that you uh, that you have or there is some kind of optimization over there el there also like you know if if I have ten parameters ten into ten it's like in fact ten to the power of ten yeah so sure there, we are so talking about hell lot of tests right so yeah how do you so yeah, every time you add a dimension, or uh, so a, a parameter is one dimension, or add a, a new value to the parameter, um, you basically have a, um, a power relationship. So you explode the parameter space. And so it's infeasible to test that many number of parameters um, using a lot of this kind of um, search methods, because th th this kind of search method tries to distribute the points evenly throughout the space. And when that space gets bigger, you need a lot more points to fill it up. The hypercube method actually works the other way around. You tell it how many points you want, and then it tries to put them in the best place. And so you can fix the number of points, and it will try and distribute them fairly regularly throughout the space, but also try and get p specific points where it thinks are going to be interesting based on parameters, how parameters might interact. So, so essentially, if I start with, like, let's say, 100 MB of heap size, if I incremented by like 
there's a 10 MB each. So the number of tests that I need to do is totally like the number of increments that I want to have yeah. to reach that operation. Yeah, in, 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 the, in the kind of the square, the coarse method, that's the case. In the, um, in the hypercube method, you can say, don't put the points closer than 10 megabits, megabytes apart, but it might not put them that close. It will probably spread them out further if it thinks that's not a very interesting dimension. Uh, typically, you'll find um, that the heap size kind of isn't, isn't very smooth. So like varying it between 0 and 100 megabytes or 0 and half a gigabyte isn't very interesting, but varying it between 3 gigabytes and 4 gigabytes might be quite interesting for a particular workload. And so w what you can do is you can kind of put the points fairly coarsely and very fairly sparsely to start with and then go back and, and um, when, you fit the, when you fit the surface like this, you can see a discontinuity and then you can do another set of tests to have a look in the place where you think the discontinuity is to see what, where, where the inflection point is. Cool. So I've got some, uh, some questions from the app. I'll come to you in a second. Um, <coughs> So th th there's a nice qualifier with this. It says, how do you handle predictions if you have things like cluster management software, like Kubernetes or Mesos, that are maybe moving workloads around while you're sampling? And then immediately followed by, if this is NDA, please ignore. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so you don't have to tell us. It's tough. It is tough. Like, part of the stuff in the scheduler at the end was to do with the fact that we're trying to place workloads on public clouds. And when, you have a, when you're at Google or Facebook doing the warehouse scale, schedulers, you can place those things based on, I mean, it's kind of a hard problem anyway, but at least you have all the data that you can, um, you can solve for the things you're interested in. There's a lot of things we can't solve for, and no noisy neighbors is something that we try to minimize. Um, and certainly, the different clouds give you different abilities. So Amazon are kind of um, offering some of the best features that on some of their larger instances, you can now select um, to be on the same LAN segment, so that when you're squirting the test load at the machine, you're not going to be subject to as many, um, as much jitter in the network as if you just got a r two random placements in the same region. And so, that, yeah, that's, that's something we have to control for, and, and it's, it's part of the work we do when we, in, when we write a new driver for a new, new type of cloud, part of our, our kind of productization process. Well, there's, there, there's, a, there's a how does it work question. <laughs> Just curious if the machine learning part of this is using genetic algorithms or something smarter to find optimal configurations. So, what does it do? What does it do? <laughs> I say, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, How long have you got? <laughs> so, the, 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 the genetic algorithm works by uh, kind of quite a um, quite, quite a small number of tests and then quite a long lot of iterations. We try and work we, we try and work the, the other way around so that we'll do more tests up front and then only maybe a couple of rounds of iteration to, um, to mine the, um, the, the, the local areas we think are interesting because it turns out for our customers that time to, time to gratification is quite important. So they're, they're happy to wait maybe two hours or three hours. They're not happy to wait a week. So there's kind of a limit to the amount of feedback we can have between tests. So most of, our, most of our machine learning is on the analytics side where we're kind of mining, mining the information in, um, uh, that we already have and kind of doing some big data analytics on the, on the telemetry that we have from kind of lots and lots of tests over time. Cool, excellent. I'm going to go running over here with the microphone. So my question is, have you ever had any really big surprises when you initially had a fairly sparse uh, test space with uh, some uh, broadly separated parameters and then tightened that up by, say, an order of magnitude and suddenly found a major optimization point or something uh, where performance has radically improved, which you wouldn't have found had you not tightened that up? Yeah, it turns out, um, I don't know if I'm going to really answer the question, you might have to ask, ask me again where it's important, but it turns out the, the best wins come from when you discover bugs in the application. So a lot of the stuff that's not been tested before, when you test it in this kind of in this kind of intensive manner, you end up finding a concurrency bug quite a lot, and or you end up finding a, a scaling bug in some some minor code that generates the HTML table or something, and you pull that out and you get you know thousands of percent, and you've had your big wins after that. Um, often, of, often we've got some quite good. Um, Often we've had some quite good wins by kind of making compromises. Like the, um, often you'll find a workload is provisioned for over provisioned or provisioned for its peak load, and and what that peak load may be a completely different kind of workload that happens overnight. 
and so you can it completely ignore it, optimize for the, the common case which happens during the day, and then either reprovision at night or add something, if possible, maybe add a swap space that allows it to complete in the nighttime period, but maybe it takes a bit longer than it did before or something like that. So yeah, the, the, the big wins are more, more lucky than you think. They're not, they're not that technical. <laughs> the smaller wins are kind of more gradual and, and you kind of tease more out of the data and have to look at the cross-correlation between the parameters and how they influence each other. Fantastic. Um, and then we have one more. Do you see the same cost savings for services using non-JVM stacks? Or is it, is it specifically in the JVM that you're working on? So yeah, most of our work is on the JVM and on the, on the common language runtime. They're both pretty similar. Um, we're both pretty similar, and that's where our, most of our data is at the moment. So what about things like if you had something like Go that's a statically linked binary and carries its own VM with it? I don't like think that. we've tested any Go, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> That'd be fun. Okay, um, thanks very much indeed. That was fantastic. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and then everyone's back here at 5 o'clock for the closing keynote. So, thank you. Thank you.